Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Matthias. How are you? Amazing. Great, great. Another day, another day in paradise, as you were saying before. <laughs> yeah. Great. So we, we missed a, a big opportunity because Matthias has a cut, but he, he, he said it was safer to bring it to another room. And yeah, it, it's a big opportunity uh, lost for me. Yeah. H having cats around is inherently unsafe. <laughs> Every Rust programmer should know. Well, there is, uh, I will say his name very badly, but John Jinkset, like their, their, their audience is like, he's crazy for, for their, I think he has more than one cat, maybe. Okay. <laughs> From my experience, a lot of frustrations are cat aficionados or they have a cat and it feels like there's some connection somehow. I don't know why. Interesting, interesting. If if anyone has uh, any idea, yeah, le let us know. You should get a cat too. Uh, I, I will soon, probably. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So you mentioned you came back from a conference, right? Yeah, I just attended a two-day conference for a client today. Oh, nice, nice. I see. Okay. It was an internal conference. I gave a talk there. It was. Very f fun, yeah. Engineering in general, not about Rust specifically. There were some Rust parts, but no, yeah. I see. Uh, like, what do you talk? What do you like to talk about at like at conferences and uh, stuff like that? That's a good question. Uh, all sorts of things. I did so many talks that had nothing to do with programming, even, and also talks that have to do with programming, but they are different. You know types of talks. I, I like to surprise myself. Sometimes I set myself arbitrary constraints, like, can I do a talk with only three words? Can I do a talk only on the terminal? Can I talk <laughs> with, do a talk without any code, just yeah, text? And sometimes without text, just code and, you know, uh, pixel graphics, everything in between. And I like to inspire people. One thing that I did was I wrote a curl implementation in lol code once just for fun oh. and showed that it would work. And yeah, usually these things are very well received because programming should be fun too. Yeah, I agree. Like most of the times we think about talks as slides and bullet points, but yeah, it, it's great to experiment with uh, other formats. For example, I think like somebody told me that there is a conference called uh, no slide conf where uh, you, you cannot see, show slides so like they told me that people do a demo or uh, they use the terminal to have uh, slides uh, stuff like that yeah <laughs> yeah constraints are extremely powerful in our lives because if you think about all of the talks that you could possibly give it can be very overwhelming the, but the moment you start limiting yourself you need to think creatively and the creative mind works really well with constraints. For example, if I tell you, can you do a talk where you have three slides with three words on it, only starting with W, then all of a sudden your mind starts to race and you come up with pretty ingenious ideas. Yeah. I like Very that. Much agree. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Sh should we start? Of course. Let's go. <laughs> Great. Yeah, let's go. Welcome to Rustship. Rustship is the podcast for developers who ship uh, code with Rust. I'm your host, Marco Yeni. I'm a Rust developer, and uh, I enjoy talking to other people, especially to other developers, and especially about Rust. So here we are. This is episode number five, and we have Matthias Endler with us. Hi, Matthias. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure. So Matthias is a senior uh, uh, software engineer with uh, 10 plus years of experience. And uh, I saw Matthias for the first time while looking at the Rust Lab uh, schedule, which is the conference that is going to happen on November in Florence, in Italy. Uh, we will meet there uh, for the first time. And uh, yeah, like uh, I was interested by your, uh, your profile, let's say, because Mainly, mainly for two reasons. So I saw that in uh, November 2021, you started uh, Corrod.dev, 
which is a Rust consultancy company where you help clients to build reliable services with Rust. And also you are the author of uh, Litchi, uh, which I think is, is probably the most reliable program to run in your CI to, for example, check the links uh, in your documentation. And so, yeah, I wanted to talk to you with you about these two topics. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Litchi started a little earlier, I guess. And both projects are pretty close to my heart. Litchi is something that I do for fun. It's a nice open source project. I'm not sure if it's the best link checker, but it certainly has the sh nicest logo. So that's something <laughs> that goes for it. And Corode is a bit more professional. Yeah. I do help clients in various spaces. I'm interested in the intersection between infrastructure and application code. So this is where I like to help. And yeah, that's about it. Great. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you've been at a session for at least seven years. Like I, I saw a talk uh, of you at Code Motion 2016 called the Why Rust. So it, it would be nice to understand how did you get into Rust in the first place? It started at FOSTEM, another conference in Europe, in Brussels, to be precise. It's at the beginning of the year. And there I saw a talk by Steve Klapnik, who then was the, I don't know, maybe main author of the first programming book or the book as they call it about Rust. And he gave a very interesting talk, not specifically about Rust, but about the history of Rust. I tried to look it up. It's no longer available. There's a similar version that he gave a couple months later, I guess. But this talk was extremely inspiring because it was titled something like The Rust That Could Have Been. And it was about patterns and things that were thrown out of the language before 1.0. And I found that exciting because even though it was about things that were removed, it taught me a lot about the design decisions that Rust made to get where it wanted to be. And I guess it's kind of obvious that it went from a language that was a bit more functional, leaning towards the ML family of languages. And it became this more systems focused uh, language, but it never forgot its roots of functional programming as well. So I think it was a really nice mix of different paradigms and it got me interested. So I started to look into Rust, maybe started to write my first code in 2015, maybe 2016 was the year where I really started to learn even more about Rust. And quickly after, we started a Rust meetup in Cologne. I was there for quite a long time. We celebrated Rust 1.0, I can still remember that. It feels like yesterday. It's been such a long time ago. It's incredible. And, you know, uh, did more and more Rust. The community has grown so far. It has been pretty insane. Yeah. The talk that you mentioned wasn't the first talk I gave about Rust. I gave a few at a few companies, but I also gave a few public ones. But, yeah, I guess it's one of the first that is still available somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's available on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, like one of the most shocking facts about Rust is that at uh, the beginning he had, it had a garbage collector and they they also had uh, green threads that I think they they, rem they removed from the standard library and so on because they weren't a zero cost abstraction, right? So, so some users, of course, preferred to have system threads and so on. Uh, yeah, so like now it's this high level language that still has zero cost abstractions. And so you can write like elegant functional code, but still have uh, like the best performance you can you can have if you if you write the, pro the program by yourself. Yeah. I think. What I find interesting in that regard is that you could build such abstractions outside of the language as a crate. So there are garbage collectors and there are green threads that you can use as libraries. How cool is that? 
no other language that I'm aware of can do that. You can hook into the system in such a deep way as in Rust. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Like, for example, the fact that when you import Tokyo from the features, you can specify how it behaves and so on. Yeah, I think not many languages can can do that. Yes, also, like, you can uh, uh, customize the allocator, you can customize uh, panic handler. So, yeah, you, you can hack it the, the way you want. And this is why also it's very convenient for uh, embedded systems, I think. Yeah, no, know a few friends that do Rust on embedded, and it feels like this is the way to go, at least from what they tell me, it feels almost like a revelation for them because all of a sudden they can use patterns that maybe were prohibited on embedded systems, like event-driven design, I guess. Um, previously, you would have to do signal handling in a very imperative way, and all of a sudden you can use an executor and run futures on an embedded device and you don't have to deal with the intricacies intricacies of handling all of the different events you just write your code as you normally would for an application it's pretty incredible yeah, definitely exciting yes so yeah like you started coro.dev in um, 2021 uh like my, my first question is why did you start uh this journey <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would ask why the name. Maybe I will ask uh, this question to myself and answer it right away because I think the story is a bit hilarious. The name Corrode obviously comes from Rust and Oxidize and initially I wanted a different name. I wanted Oxide, which <laughs> you guessed already it was taken. taken already. Yeah. <laughs> and then my second idea also revolved around this oxide or oxidate or something like that but all of these names were basically taken and i knew that there was a rust parade called corrode which would take c code and produce rust code and i really liked it i really liked the idea and i loved the name of course and i knew it existed so i didn't want to touch it necessarily but when i looked for a name that was available again because the project was archived and it was no longer maintained and the domain also happened to be free so i was extremely happy and um yeah this is how the name came to be but nice. i mean close to yeah like question. it's a yeah. it's a it's a yeah just to say that it's a great name because that's that's what made me curious about you because i saw like matthias at corro.dev and they oh what like i i i imagined that Corrodo that was related to Rust because it's very similar to yeah oxidation and all these patterns. Yes. So that's why I clicked on the link. So it's a good awesome. name, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On a deeper level, it also contains the letters C and R. So C for the C programming language and R for Rust. And there are many, many different things. It's easy to spell. You can type it in and it's just one word. I really like that too. And Lately, I also got corot.rs as a domain, which is really cool, but I haven't used it yet, so it doesn't even point to any website. But if okay. someone has an idea for this, it would be cool. Maybe a developer platform or something a bit more nerdy would be fun. Maybe someone has an idea. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, how did I get started? Or why did I even start on this endeavor? At some point, working at Trivago, I realized that I wanted to do Rust full time. I think the market was pretty early. It was I had a couple of customers in mind. I had a couple of ideas, but nothing too concrete. But I knew that I wanted to do more Rust and do so full time. And at the same time, I grew an interest in businesses, how businesses work and entrepreneurship. And it's one of the things that you can not learn if you work a nine to five job of course you can have side projects and all of that stuff but it's not necessarily the same experience as if you were a completely solo entrepreneur and yeah so i looked for options and it pretty much became clear that i wanted to start simple maybe have one or two customers and yeah take it easy 
and just test the waters. In the worst case, it would fail and it wouldn't be such a big deal. But it turns out, yeah, there is demand. And maybe we will get to that in a second. But the general idea is that the market is still pretty early and it's still pretty young. And there might not be full-time Rust positions necessary in all the companies. But it feels like a lot of companies are starting to understand the power of Rust. And I think it's a, a great market. It has a lot of growth potential. Even though you will have to do integration work with existing code bases and other languages, but you know that's always the case, I guess. Yeah, that's great to hear. Uh, yeah, like my my experience is the same. Like uh, at my previous company, even if uh, like even if before I, I knew about Rust, uh, my ex colleagues are, are telling me that they are uh, evaluating Rust uh, for uh, for new projects uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think that's encouraging for uh, people that are listening that maybe want to work with Rust uh, and maybe they don't find uh, uh, jobs right now. So should we tell them keep going because it's it's going to happen? Throughout my career, my mantra was to invest in growing markets because mm. then you don't have to be the sharpest tool in the tool bag. You just have to be around and you have to be involved in such things and the market will kind of solve it for you of, over time. But I guess the main part is that you need to be patient and you need to be, how can I say, considerate about the constraints that you um, put upon yourself because you should be flexible. You should not mainly focus on doing Rust for the sake of doing Rust. You should always solve problems for customers. That's the that's that advice, yes. And yeah, like what what's what kind of services do you offer uh, as part of Corrodo Dev for companies? My previous occupations were around monitoring performance optimizations. And I think this is really great in Rust as well. There are a lot of companies that have problems with monitoring, have problems with performance. And this is a nice starting point for them sometimes. For example, they write small little logging tools or little command line applications, or they tweak a part of their stack that is slow. And there's a lot of tools for measuring performance. And some of that is written in Rust. So this is what I can do. I usually focus on these niche areas. And I also like to think about idiomatic Rust and web development. So these are the areas where I focus on the most right now because this is what I learned in the past. And I'm a fan of um, clean code. I'm a fan of architecture. I like the main driven design. And a lot of those things can be used in Rust and surprisingly work very well out of the box. And especially when it comes to performance, you don't really have to do much to make an application very performant in Rust. And of course, what we talked about before also ties into that. You don't have a good garbage collector, so there's nothing that would stop your application and collect the garbage. And all of these things kind of add up to a very nice picture. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, like, do you work mainly for companies that want to adopt Rust or for, com for companies that already use it and maybe they need some help? both. There are companies that are large and they adopt Rust because of stability or because of performance reasons. I mentioned stability first because even though they usually start with a performance background or with performance in mind, usually they stick with Rust for stability. So that means less on-call outages, more uptime, less server costs and less over-provisioning and all of that stuff. And this is really good. These are established companies. They usually come in because of performance issues or because they want to learn how to improve their code base, make it more idiomatic, because these are things that you cannot necessarily learn from books right now. And there are very few workshops. And oh, yeah, this is one area. And the other area are startups that are just experimenting with completely new ideas. 
and they might start with something experimental and they have a team that they need to train on Rust on the job. And for that, you need courses, you need to be a bit more hands-on, do some pair programming, maybe establish the architecture. This is really interesting, like how the application itself is structured and then teach them how they can maintain it themselves. So I would say it's both established companies have legacy code and performance problems and want stability. And then you've got the newer companies that know that Rust can be a competitive advantage. I see. And you also mentioned that uh, you are in the niche uh, of like, uh, you mentioned observability and performance. Don't you think that like Rust is already a, like a, a good niche to be in? In like, for example, if you say I'm a Rust consultant, is this enough? Or like you, you need to say, you, you need to find the niche in the niche. So I'm a Rust consultant that is specialized in X, Y, Z. Yeah, even though I know a lot of really great Rust developers, I have yet to meet many developers who are great in all of coding, all of the infrastructure that we have nowadays, because Remember, we talked about it before. There are projects in embedded and in infrastructure and in graphics and in machine learning and in data science and in front end and UIs and whatever. And so I think it helps if you build some expertise around either one or maybe two of these areas. And then you combine it with a really strong command of Rust. In this sense, you create a unique niche for yourself and people will reach out for you if they have problems in this specific space. This is what I see from other consultancies as well in the Rust space. They usually pick one area and then they double down on that. And that makes a lot of sense because, yeah, companies have existing stacks, they have existing problems, and it helps them if you have some domain expertise going in. So I would advise people to look for something that they are really interested in and maybe something that they build side projects with and then focus on this if it is well received. That's at least what works okay for me and maybe it would work nice for others too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like probably companies when they reach out, of course they have a specific domain and you should also have a knowledge about like libraries that are used in that domain and stuff like that. So of course, right. yeah, you cannot know uh, everything about exactly. programming, as you said. Yeah, makes sense. And like, are there some particular uh, works that you've done that you're proud that you want to share with us? Like, for example, some some nice outcomes that uh, uh, you saw after uh, your job? I can't really name any companies, unfortunately, because I'm on the NDA. But the things that I like is when people go and they understand uh, Rust better after a workshop, for example. Mm. So maybe they work with, say, GraphQL and they work on a very low level and they work on routing. And then you show them a few tricks on how to handle errors better. And suddenly they understand this concept. Or you maybe have a one-on-one -on -one with someone like a pair programming session and suddenly they understand the lower level concepts about HTTP and how web servers work. And you see in their eyes that suddenly it clicks and it's demystified. I like this moment when people understand that it's not magic, it was built by other humans and it is made to be broken and also reconstructed by humans. This is one of the nicest parts. When it comes to concrete projects, the one thing that I liked was a project around domain-driven design because it was the first bigger application that I helped with in this space and it turned out really well. So the result was that we had to do less integration tests and we could do a lot more with unit tests. And it doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you have a large infrastructure with many, many microservices, booting up these microservices can take time. And if you can avoid that by having proper tests around your domains, around your entities, this can mean a 10x improvement of feedback cycle. That means 
you know, context switches are less because you can focus on a change. You can run the tests, which are unit tests. They are really quick. And suddenly you can move forward with confidence and that saves a lot of time. That means sometimes Rust is also good for say fast feedback loops if you do it right and you do a lot of things at compile time. Uh, whereas in bigger infrastructure or bigger organizations, a lot of testing is done at runtime with integration tests or um, how can I say, um, all of these tests that happen before a deployment. Um, yeah, and they are usually very expensive and they take a lot of time. Yeah, I think that, so the the, the feedback loop, loop is fast when like the compiler tells you an error before you get it at runtime. There is still the problem of like slow compile time and that uh, which slows the feedback feedback loop, but yeah, it's a it's a trade off, and I like uh, this part of the trade off. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. even more than that, if you don't have a database connection, and you can, for example, have a repository which implements your database trade, then you can run unit tests where you before needed functional tests or smoke tests or at least integration tests and yeah suddenly you move from something that is very flaky and brittle and takes a lot of time to something that is just a quick test and yeah you understand that your constraints of your entities are kind of guided or guarded by the compiler and by the type system and so on and this is a very magical moment which probably you only learn after using Rust for a while and really leaning into the traits and, and the patterns of uh, what Rust provides you. Yeah, I agree. Like, for example, you mentioned uh, error handling. I think something it's, so at the beginning, it confuses you a bit, like if you're used to exceptions and stuff like that. But when it clicks, when you get it, then you want to port it on every other language. Yeah, I, I saw also bad ports of it other programming languages, but yeah, it's um, uh, it's great, yes. And so I was curious, like, how do, are you enjoying consultancy versus being uh, an employee? So what are the pros and cons of, of these two? Yeah, I can see both sides. It was really nice to be an employee, not going to lie, because a lot of the things that you need to do as a consultant are taken off of you if you're an employee. It's like having a uh, personal secretary, someone that takes care of finding jobs, finding offers, doing advertisements and so on, and marketing and, and you know, reaching out to people. This, this is something that you need to do on your own. And inside a company, this is very, yeah, relaxing almost, I would say. It's a bit like comparing a cruise ship with a jet ski. If you're on a cruise ship, then everything is managed for you and you can focus on having a good time and really delivering value and enjoying yourself. But if you are on a jet ski, you can literally go wherever you want. It's a bit more risky and it's a bit less protected and padded, but at the same time you have total control and total um, yeah, choice of where you want to go next. And with a cruise ship, that's not that easy. So if you want to change the destination, then you need to convince a lot of people before that happens. And this is how or big organizations work sometimes. They are very slow. They sometimes move, but you know it takes them a while to change course. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily comparable. If you are not a person that is necessarily extroverted or at least can convince themselves to talk to other people and have regular calls and maybe also expose yourself in a way that, for example, you write articles or you do collaborations or you're not afraid to talk through business negotiations, then I would say consulting is not for you. But if you say, well, I'm a little bored with one position and I would like to try something a little more exciting and I want to learn more about how different companies work, then maybe you should consider it. But I just want to say that there are also ways in between. For example, if you talk to your employer and you say, ah, yeah, I really love it here, but 
I would like to try this other thing and maybe I can try with two days per week. So I would like to work for only three days for this company, or maybe we can settle on four days. Maybe this could also work. Or you say, I really like this side project. I would to like to make it a part of my job description. This might also be something that you could negotiate. So you don't have to go all in immediately. Makes sense, yes. And so you you mentioned that as a yeah, as a solo entrepreneur, you you need to do everything by yourself, like marketing and so on. Have you considered the um, uh hiring some someone else or like using like adding adding an assistant or stuff stuff like that? Yeah, I don't know anyone who does that. Hiring people is hard. First you have to find the right person then it has to click then they yeah you need to find work for them of course you also need to pay them which might be expensive depending on their salary ranges then you need to align your mission you need to set objectives you need to set away time for communication it's a lot of things that are thing like hidden costs of hiring and so a lot of people that I talk to and me myself personally, I try to defer hiring as much as possible. I rather think that mm, it's a bit like open source where you can collaborate on various projects if you have separate entities. It works really well. For example, you have a bigger task or a bigger client. Then it can work if both people are consultants and they collaborate and then you share the income, for example. That That is something that could work. The other thing that some people do is to go through some sort of agency where you pay them a certain cut of your revenue and then they handle all of the paperwork for you. They send invoices. Mm, that can work too. Maybe if you find the right one, they would even manage to get you offers or positions but at the same time writing invoices is really not that hard if you're consistent about it and you can get used to all of these practices as long as you're organized now you need a certain level of organization and discipline and this is another thing no one tells you how much time you can spend on what and it can be risky to be dragged into one thing just because you're extremely curious about it. But at the end of the day, it's still work and you need to set constraints for yourself and for your clients. They expect you to be another company. It's not like they expect you to be an employee. You have to the responsibilities of a company. It's a B2B negotiation. And you have to be very clear about this. I see. Uh, so one thing I noticed in, is that in your website, corrod.dev, you have many blog posts about Rust, about idiomatic Rust and stuff like that. Do you have any advice on how to write good blog posts, maybe for the people that are listening that want to start doing this? The most important thing is keep writing. Write more, write a lot. Initially, write about whatever you like, whatever you want to read. Start with a topic and just go for it. If you feel like you're getting bored, just switch the topic and it's fine. The motivation should be to keep writing and to take it as a practice, as something that you do as part of your work. Eventually, you will see a pattern emerge. You will probably write about the same or similar things. And this is usually a good indication that you're onto something. This is a topic that you're interested in and something that you can say a lot about because it's not just one post, it's a series of posts. Now, once you reach the step, I would say, it's a good way to stop and reflect and understand what it is that you're trying to say through all of these posts. And if you find the pattern and you find your inner motivation, this is the best that can happen because all of a sudden you can center all of the content around it and it will feel way more natural for you. For example, for me, I wrote a, about a lot of side projects and topics and I really love it. And I still do that from time to time, just on my personal blog. But on Corota Dev, I only focus on idiomatic Rust. This is my niche that I want to focus on. 
And I think there's not that many articles out there. And it feels like, yeah, these articles are well received because they help people that have some prior experience with Frost and they are interested in this content and they want to learn more about how to structure their code and how to introduce design patterns and so on. And I guess everyone can find such a niche. It could be embedded, could be machine learning, could be infrastructure, could be rewriting bash tools or like uh, Unix tools to be more precise. It doesn't have to be one tool that you maybe translate. You maybe can do multiple and make a series out of it. Um, whatever it is, try to find something that you're passionate about and that you can write more than one article about. At least three, I would say. Three three to four is good, good measure. And then you know you're onto something here. Yeah, so this is how I write. And I'm still really bad at writing, let me say that. I, I still try to improve. My writing is not decent. I'm always unhappy about what I produce, partially because I'm not a native speaker. But on the other hand, sometimes you have a really nice little idea and you iterate on it until the vision that you had in the past is completely gone and blurred. And this is so sad to see. To avoid that, I encourage you to read people like Julia Evans, who has a really nice style. And the reason why her writing is so nice is that it comes from the heart. It's very personal. She only describes what she herself has experienced. She writes stories. And this is enticing because transparency and honesty and authenticity is so important in writing. Many, many people write for Google, but they should instead write for humans. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so uh, you said that, like you want to, like you maybe you're you're not happy about how, how you write because you're not a native, a native speaker. But I would add to this that uh, I had from an interview to a, to somebody who is a LinkedIn instructor that they they like non-native speakers because they tend to explain concepts in uh, in an easier way. And so I think that from a certain point of view, being a, a non-native speaker, and I'm, of course I'm speaking for myself too, is can be an advantage because like you don't use uh, uh, you don't use complex words uh, and stuff like that. Yes. Also, yeah. Thank you for the advice about uh, thinking about blog posts as a series and not as single uh, shots. Because, yeah, uh, this is something I I never I never considered. Why do you think that it's important to consider uh, blog posts as a series and not just as a, as a single topic? It's very hard to come up with topics for a single blog post. For example, if you ask me, you can only write one blog post next month, what should it be about? Then in my mind, I'm thinking it needs to be something exceptional. It needs to be great. It needs to be a work of art, it needs to represent all of the work that I did during this month. And this way I set the expectations extremely high and the pressure rises. And the outcome will be that everyone's disappointed, the readers, the writer, it will be frustrating and it will be work. It will feel very laborious. Whereas if you pick a topic and you set yourself the goal to write at least three articles about it, all of a sudden you set a different guideline, you set a different pace. It's a marathon and not a sprint anymore. You start to think about the bigger picture. What is the story behind this one article? What could I say next? Because remember, I need to write two more articles about it. And if I like use all my bullets in the first one, I won't have any material for the next two. So you try to be a little bit more cautious, but also coming up with this streak of articles is not easy. It's a very hard task because it's a very personal thing and you need to reflect on your work and what you're really passionate about. If you cannot come up with such a topic, Maybe you sit down, write down a few things that you're interested in and see what they all have in common. And then ask why a few times, like, why am I interested in this topic? And then 
why is it that this interests me or you go down that rabbit hole you ask why five times and then all of a sudden you will find the true answer to what you want to write about and the 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 vision or the the expression you want to make yeah I see. Yeah, thank you. It's very, it was very interesting. Um, yeah, now I would like to talk about uh, Lichi, which is your. Uh, how do you do you do you define it as your side project? Uh, yeah. I would like to know. Uh, yeah, if you can describe what it is and uh, why why did you why did you write it in the first place? When I looked for tools that would help me improve my code. I stumbled across a lot of linters. Linters are tools that go through your code and they help you find uh, unidiomatic patterns. And there are a lot of linters out there for different languages. And no one seemed to have written down all of them in a list. So <clears throat> a while ago, a couple of years ago, I think it was also around 2015, it's been a while, I started to collect all of the linters that I could find. Yeah, and you have, yeah. In your GitHub, you, if you go to Matthias Sandler GitHub, you can find uh, this awesome website with so many linkers. Yeah, it's it, with so many static uh, analyzers linters, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah linters. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. There's a website called analysis-tools.dev if you want to have a look. And these tools have websites, of course, and they have readmes and documentations and so on. And I had listed all of the tools with links on uh, the readme file and they kept breaking from time to time so i need to go in and fix it and then i needed to yeah create a pull request and and change it and it was really laborious and at the same time a lot of people told me that some links were broken and they created issues and it was a bit of a nightmare to maintain and that's why i looked for link checkers I wanted a tool that I could integrate into my code base and it would check the links for me on a regular basis. And it turns out there are a few of such tools, but they were not in good shape. Some of them were extremely slow, others required a runtime. For example, they were written in Ruby and I didn't want to use Ruby for this problem. Or some of them were really decent, but no longer maintained. And so, I found one which I really liked. It was called Lish, and Lish is written in Go. And I wanted to use it, but the author said that they didn't want to maintain that anymore. So I was kind of looking for something in Rust because I was pretty passionate about that already. And it turns out there were none or just a few, but they didn't really cover all my use cases. I needed something that would support markdown files and HTML files, but also websites. And so I wrote my own, thought, how hard can it be? Give me a weekend. <laughs> and I recorded an episode of Hello Rust, which used to be a YouTube channel about the Rust programming language. And you can still look it up. And yeah, that was when? Two years ago, I guess, or maybe even three by now. And yeah, this tool has grown in functionality. For some reason, people started to use it. And it is integrated in many projects by now, I think maybe 5,000 GitHub repositories. And it is used by many different companies, Google, Microsoft, Amazon. Many companies use it as part of their regular link checking routine for some projects. And that's why the community grew. And yeah, with it grew the maintenance burden and the number of edge cases I need to handle over time. Yeah, like there, there's um, your talk about Lychee that people can find on YouTube if they look for, yeah, Matthias Handler, Lychee, Rust. It's the first that shows, of course. Uh, yeah, it was hilarious. And yeah, we will go through that a bit uh, in this episode as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I want to add that I'm in the middle of those five thousand decide repositories that use Lychee. I said, well, okay, I will add Le Lychee. I will find maybe one or two broken links. I think I, I found maybe 20 or 30, I don't remember now. So um, I, I like a call to action to the users 
to, to the listeners, integrate Litchi into your uh, side projects uh, on GitHub and so on, uh, because you will find so many broken links that you have no idea. And uh, yeah, regarding this, how can people add Litchi? How do you suggest your users to, to add Litchi to their projects? The first step could be to install the Litchi binary and run it from a terminal. This way you get a feeling for the tool, what it can do, what it cannot do, what sort of false positives it finds, because there are false positives still. It's a very messy world out there with lots of parsing problems and edge cases, and you will definitely encounter issues with Litchi as well. But I would say for the most part, if you're happy with what you get, then the next step could be to fix these links manually, of course. And Ooh, we lost uh, Matthias for a moment. So we will wait a bit until, yeah, here we go. We I'm lost it just for, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just let the last uh, 10 seconds. Yeah, so once you tried it and you are happy with the results, you can integrate it into your repository through a GitHub action. So you set up the Litchi action on, on GitHub, you integrate it as a GitHub workflow, and then you can set it up as a cron job. I guess the usual interval is to check all the links once per week, as far as I remember, or once per day, I can't remember. Anyway, in any case, it will create an issue whenever it finds a single broken link. It will create an issue for you on the repository and you will be notified and you can fix it immediately. And if you find links that are pathologically broken, things that they just never work or websites that don't allow link checking, there are a couple edge cases, then you can exclude them. You can add a litchi ignore file to your repository and add all of the links that you want to exclude. The same for files, you can exclude paths, you can exclude directories through block patterns and all of that stuff. And that's pretty much it. There was an idea to build a platform for it as well, a little SaaS service that you can run yourself. If someone is interested in giving it a try, please reach out, you can get access to the repository, you can test it. Right now, I don't have time to test it myself, but I would love to get some feedback. The idea there was, this is helpful if you have more than one repository and you don't want to get issues all the time. Because these things can get annoying at some time. If you have a lot of links and things constantly break, then you get a lot of issues. Of course, you can group them and stuff, but it would be nicer to have a web interface, I would say, where you can search and group and filter. And this is the Litchi service, as I call it. This would be the next step. And for this, I would love to get some contributions. I would love to open source it as well, but I would say the code is not the prettiest. If there's someone out there who wants to co-maintain it or wants to have a look, I would be delighted to have a chat. Nice. Yeah, so I didn't know that, like, maybe I, I, I don't remember now that the, the GitHub action as a way to create issues when it finds uh, broken links, that's that's interesting. Uh, the way I configured it is that it checks on every PR if all the links are correct. Maybe it's it works because I don't have that many links, but I agree that like probably if you have a big repository with many links, it's better to run it periodically. Yes. Um, maybe one more thing that I forgot. There are two other ways to use Litchi. You can use Litchi as a library now. Mm. And there is a Python wrapper by my friend Jörg Botnik, who used it to learn Rust, which is incredible. And so you can use Litchi in Python now, which is incredible. And the other thing is, I would love to have a way to check pull requests. The idea that I had once was you can create a simple GitHub app and install it in your organization and it would go and check every pull request. Uh, this is partially done. And again, if someone's interested in this, I need more contributors and more maintainers. So I'd be happy to walk you through the code base and see what needs to be done. 
maybe if someone has experience with building GitHub apps, that would be a good starting point. And from a user experience perspective, it would be the best of both worlds. You have a very lightweight tool, but you don't have to maintain it yourself because you get notified on a pull request when something breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, and so you check only the files uh, of the PR or maybe only the links contained in the changes of the PR? Mm, not right now. <laughs> right now, we don't have any checks for pull requests. We check in through a cron job. But of course, if you do it for PRs, then it would be amazing to find the div and only check the changed links. That would be extremely cool. And there were people who did that with Litchi. They, they have their own sophisticated pipeline and they run a little div tool before. It seems mm. like there are actions for this that give you the file names. And you can pipe that as input into Litchi. But it would be cool to automate that such that you don't have to maintain that code anymore. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's... On that note, just real quick, sorry. On that note, you can also check out the documentation, litchi.cli.rs, because there you can find a couple of recipes on how to integrate Litchi for your workflow. There were many creative people that contributed to that and they came up with their completely own ideas on how to use Litchi, which I never thought about. For example, yesterday I heard of someone that doesn't even use Litchi as a link checker, but only to extract links and rewrite them in mm. different formats. Of course you can do that. There's a Litchi minus minus dump option for this. Yeah, like yeah, once you your tool is out there, people will find like you will get amazed by how much people are on, on your tool and so on. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you what what does the Litchi Epipath look? So how in your mind uh, checking a link what was in like the weekend that you started working on it? The happy path. My expectation was most of the web is completely sane and <laughs> HTML is structured and websites behave in a standardized way. But of course, going in, I already knew that it might have been a bit more romantic than I originally anticipated. But I didn't expect it to be that bad. Um, there are literally edge cases all around the web and even around checking links and there are so many basic things which are not really handled well or cannot even be handled well in a consistent way. You need edge cases, you need exceptions all over the place because it's li literally messy. And this is also fine to some extent because as programmers, we don't appreciate how easy it was for us to start building websites in the past. You can make mistakes, you can forget tags, and you can forget special characters, and the website still somewhat resembles what you had in mind. But of course, looking at it from the other perspective, from someone that has to parse that stuff, it can be extremely difficult as well. The web is extremely forgiving, and to parse websites, you need a browser-grade parser. And this is literally what Litchi integrates. It uses the same parser that is in Servo that might or might not become the future of Firefox. Who knows? But at least parts of Servo, as far as I'm aware, were integrated into Firefox already. And it's kind of a nice engine for parsing HTML because this part is really well done. And we rarely get any edge cases from this. And it's reasonably performant as well. Now, I also want to mention another one um, by Antitaker, who is also on GitHub. It's called HTML5GUM. It is a different HTML parser library, a very nice crate, which is stateless and streamable, I would say. It uses way less memory than HTML5 ever from Servo, but it covers the same edge cases, and it does so in a really nice way. And we support both engines, and we support pull down CMARC for markdown parsing, and we have Linkify for plain text. 
that means you can even pipe in PDFs and it will totally find a lot of links from PDFs. It's not going to be perfect, but it will find a lot of cases. And yeah, overall, I would say this was nothing that I could have anticipated how mm -hmm. hard it would be to parse files and parse input. And then also even just thinking about brokenness, what is a broken link? What does it entail? This was another thing that I wasn't prepared for. And to this day, I mostly see issues where other people use the tool and are moderately happy with it. I only see problems and edge cases all the time. <laughs> and yeah, that, I can common. tell you it's, it's tricky. It's common, yes. So, so you mentioned that you have different ways to parse um, HTML uh, and Markdown and so on. Are the, those all loaded in the binary? And so, for example, from the you can custom you can choose what you want to use from command line arguments and stuff like that. Yes, you can okay. pick your HTML5 engine. We only support one Markdown parser simply because there are no other Markdown parsers I'm aware of that are as good as pull down CMark. It's pretty much an industry standard nowadays in the Rust community, and it. It's done extremely well by Reflevin, so uh, kudos to that. And for plain text parsing, we are more or less happy with Linkify, but HTML is very special because you want to decide between correctness and performance, and there are different trade-offs. I would say if you need a 100% correct one, there's no such option, but HTML5 ever comes pretty close. But as I said, HTML5 GUM is almost as correct, maybe even more correct by now. Don't uh, judge me on that. But it's definitely more performant, and this is why it's the default. And you can select this through command line arguments, but you can also compile your own version of Litchi with different feature flags and pick the engine there. And yeah, I think it's a a nice trade-off between being opinionated on one end and letting the users choose their preferences. Yeah, interesting. So let's say that you parsed all the links from your HTML, uh, Markdown, and so on. How do you check if uh, a link is valid? We lost again Matthias, but he... yeah. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry, did you, did you hear my question? Oh, yeah. So once you parse all the links from your documents, your uh, HTML files and so on, how do you check if a link is valid? In Litchi, you have different stages. The collector collects links from inputs and the extractor extracts links from inputs. And so in the collector, you you Actually, in the in the extractor, you extract the links. So you, you take the links and you find them in your documents. And the collector collects all of them from different inputs. Now, suddenly, you have a stream of links. And now you need to verify one by one if this is valid or not. An experienced developer might already see that this is an inherently parallelizable or yeah, concurrently executable problem. And this is exactly how Litchi is also built. Of course, it uses an async framework, Tokyo in this case, and it has an executor which runs all of these links checks concurrently and yeah, in different tasks. So every check is a future and we check links with request and with the Octocrap uh, library, which is the GitHub wrapper crate. And we do this because GitHub is very stringent. Just one second. We, it, it will come back soon, probably. I can still yeah. hear you. But yeah, you're I back. Think... <laughs> yeah, you were saying, so you use, why do you use Octogram? And they don't allow you to check too many links through HTML before they block you. And this is why it's very nice to have an API layer with a proper token. 
and GitHub allows you to do way, way more requests through that. And this is usually oh. why we use a proper API client for it. In any case, through APIs, it's pretty easy to check if a thing is up or not. You just interpret the result that you get from GitHub. But for any normal website, it is very tricky to decide if something is broken or not. Of course, you have a 404, which people usually associate with brokenness. But you have multiple different stages as well, like a 403 or 418, for example, if someone gets the reference. But even if you say everything that is not working is broken, so you say everything that is not a 200 would be brokenness, you would be mistaken because there are things like redirects and there are things like no content and server errors, but they are flaky and authentication issues and so on. Now, you can have a pretty standardized rule set, but no matter what you come up with, people will also find counterexamples of things that are not covered by your cases, by your logic. And this is why in Litchi you can define what is an error and what is not based on the status code right now. Maybe there will be more sophisticated checks in the future. Maybe like things where you can script an outcome with WebAssembly, for example. That would be extremely cool too. But so far, you can only check whether something is up or down based on the status code and based on the method that you use. It can be a GET or a POST request or a, a PUT request. And you also have the possibility to add additional authentication to circumvent authentication issues. Okay. With basic uh, auth, for example. I didn't get that. How do you want to use WebAssembly? If you think about it, it would be really cool if Litchi could interpret JavaScript. Right now, we don't have a JavaScript engine. That means only what we get from the server as static HTML is something that we can check and parse. But the web nowadays is also based on JavaScript. And you should be able to execute it at some point. Now, JavaScript itself is something that maybe you don't want to execute with a lot of permissions on your local machine. Uh, this is what browsers are for. And it's like a sandbox. And it would be nice to have such a sandbox for the JavaScript engine. And this is where WebAssembly comes in. Technically, you could build a system which takes your website, runs it in a sandbox like JS DOM, renders the page, and then returns the rendered HTML so that you can extract the links. That will be one use case for WebAssembly. Another use case for WebAssembly would be sophisticated scripting for redirects. For example, you check internal links, and you know that there's a certain pattern that maps to a different internal URL. And you can do that with a simple little script, and you can put that in, into WebAssembly. That means for every outgoing request, you can rewrite the request however you like, and then return back the request that should be handled for um, link checking. And Litchi will do the rest and do the extraction and so on from the page that you redirected to. And the same for the responses. You want to do various modifications on the responses. And I think WebAssembly is a really nice use case for customizability, not only for server code, but also for CLI tools. Yeah. Like, I didn't think that JavaScript, in theory, yeah, you're right. It can edit the HTML by, for example, pushing other links, and you don't see them. So. In theory, you can yeah, run JavaScript inside the sandbox environment, render the HTML, and then read the links from there, right? Did I understand correctly? For example, yes. Yeah. OK, interesting. So you mentioned that uh, like you can, of course, check all the links uh, in parallel. But I wonder if like probably websites return a uh, an HTTP status code uh, 429 uh, after after a while because you're sending them too many requests. Uh, is that something you experience in Litchi? And do you do you have a way to avoid it? 429s are probably 
one of the most common issues with link checking at scale. Litchi is no exception. Websites don't like if you crawl them, but if you check links and only check availability, it feels like crawling to them because even though we don't parse the website body and only the headers by default, it still feels like almost like an attack to them. And they kind of want to block it off after a while. We see that a lot with very popular pages, but even the non-popular ones sometimes put you into um, bot detection protection mechanisms or like put your IP into a, a blocked uh, list or something like that. And in order to avoid that, you want to make sure that you don't overload the servers and you are a nice citizen of the web. It sounds very easy. You just respect the rate limit headers, but it turns out rate limit headers are not really common outside of APIs. And the only thing that you can do then is be very gentle with servers. Maybe you start with a single link and then you ramp up and you go and maybe make a few more checks and eventually you notice where the sweet spot is and you don't send too many requests, but at the same time you you're reasonably performant. And this is a very tricky task. There are algorithms for this. And some of them are very well known, like the token bucket algorithm, which allows you to do a regular stream of requests. You can think of it this way. You have a bucket and you have a couple coins in there. And every time you make a request, you take a coin out. And if there's no more coin in the bucket, you have to wait until there's another coin in the bucket. And the coins get refilled on a frequent basis. Say you get one coin every 10 seconds. That means this is your maximum rate of requests. And this way you can have a nice burst in the beginning where you can have multiple requests. And then after you exhausted these requests, you wait until you can do the next one. And this is a very interesting algorithm that we try to include now. And we're working on better rate limiting and being better citizens on, of the web, it's it's not necessarily easy. We managed to DOS a few sites from time to time <laughs> because we kind of overloaded them. And yeah, it's it's life, it's fair. So we're trying to, to be good here and we're still looking for good algorithms and good solutions. We even wrote a parser for those rate limit headers, which you can use for other projects as well. And these are one of the few steps that we were trying and we're still experimenting with this. Yeah. We didn't expect that it would even become such a successful tool. <laughs> After all, it's still a side project. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's it's very useful. And like in your talk, you you show crazy things that website can do. Like for example, probably my favorite was LinkedIn that returns uh 999 status code what's what what are your favorite things that website do when trying to check check links <laughs> another one that i like is youtube even the though the youtube link might be leading nowhere and the video was taken offline a long time ago youtube will still happy return happily return a 200 status code and in the HTML body, it will not have a video link. And the way around it is something that was contrib contributed by a user that used to write their own link checker. And they said the only way they found to circumvent it is to check the thumbnail of the video instead of the video itself. I think this is brilliant because you don't need a lot of resources. You just rewrite the URL to something else and the check would just work. But of course, these things are brittle, so they can break over time. Twitter is a very notorious case where it has gotten worse and worse to check Twitter up to a point where we cannot check it anymore, even to the best of our um, abilities. The only way to do it for sure would be to use JavaScript for it. But as I said, we don't have JavaScript support right now but that would be a really nice use case that i would like to see fixed and then be able to parse twitter once more 
uh, apart from that, these are the main ones that are huge and a lot of people use them, of course. The one that is a bit more saddening because it taps into public infrastructure and things that should never break is the OI links. They are things that you can put into research papers and usually are maintained by universities. And the idea is that they should never fail and should always resolve to the original resource, which is vital because your entire research is based on that. But even these links, as sad as it is, break from time to time. And we have a lot of breakage around these tools because a lot of people use Litchi for this specific use case in research and academia. And this is certainly something that we want to support, but we don't have the bandwidth to do so. That's why I'm really happy that one user took on this challenge and is now going to all of the different entities that maintain the UI links and tells them about the breakage of their infrastructure. <laughs> it's just not a really thankful task, but overall, this will make the web a better place. And also, just a quick shout out to archive.org. They do an amazing job. If we as developers could do one thing to improve infrastructure or the future in general, I know, big words now, but I really believe that we should all collectively back up more and preserve some parts of the internet more. We have the skills. We can go and take snapshots. We can extract them and compress them and put them somewhere. Because in the future, this will be incredibly valuable. Even if you only do it for your own resources and you put that into a tarball and put it on GitHub, or maybe not GitHub, but somewhere else where there's a replication outside of bigger platforms. That's amazing. More people should do that. I agree. Uh, can you slightly try to disable your webcam for a few seconds and, and then re-enable it? Of course. Um, in the meantime, yeah, like I like that uh, Litchi is a community effort in a way. So for example, that user, you mentioned that he found out how to, how to find if a YouTube link is broken by checking the thumbnail or this other user that is uh, like bothering uh, un university and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, also you mentioned, of course, uh, uh, archive.org. Uh, yeah, it's not part of Lishi, but yeah, uh, it's it's a great community effort. Yeah, I like it. And um, like you mentioned some features you want to add to Lishi, for example, the service, the GitHub app. Is there something more, some more uh, like call to actions for the community you have? What I would love to see is people using it for different use cases, things that I haven't thought about. Litchi is just an engine, so you can take the library and then do anything with links. It's very generic. It will help you find links in anything. And it can even used, be used in a streaming manner. I don't know why you should do that necessarily, but maybe, for example, you could think of some sort of service, a web worker in Cloudflare that you can uh, use to extract links from documents. And you don't have to run it on the CLI. You can maybe have a website where you drag and drop a document and it would extract the links for you. That would be a cool thing. And it could run as a worker, for example. These are things that are outside of the Litchi core but they are incredibly valuable if someone wants to maintain that stuff. For example, there are a lot of eBooks out there and people publish them on Amazon and Amazon actually discourages broken links. They penalize you if there are too many broken links in your eBooks, in your EPUB documents. Now, a publisher would have to go and check all of the links manually before publication, because it's such a vital step of the process. Now, I'm aware that links deprecate over time, but at least at the moment where you publish a book, the links should work. And if you have a tool which you could use, a web app, for example, where you drag and drop your file 
and it would show you all of the extracted links and check if they were working or not, that would be really cool. It would be helpful. And you can even build it in such a way that it's completely client-side. It doesn't even need to be uploaded anywhere because you can run it on WebAssembly in your client, which is really nice. Um, I think this is one thing I really love about Rust, this connection to WebAssembly and that you can potentially run it anywhere. This has so much potential and there are so many things like this that people can try. And maybe this is one wish that I have for the future of this project to see more such use cases, to build a stronger ecosystem around the core. Nice, nice. And yeah, like, I think that for for Rust is like the, the favorite languages, for, uh, the favorite language for developers that, that uh, work with WebAssembly and stuff like that. And yeah, it's it's a great use case. I, I see many web developers that want to learn Rust and they use WebAssembly as an excuse to to learn it. Yes. And so in your talk, you staying staying on the same topic, like in your talk, you shared that many companies use Litchi in in their CI, but like they rarely give sponsor you on GitHub. And yeah, call to action for the. Uh, for the listeners, if you use Litchi and you enjoy it, uh, you can you, you should consider sponsoring Matthias on GitHub. So uh, my question is, do you have any plans to monetize Litchi? Maybe uh, using some of the WebAssembly capabilities and stuff like that. Yeah, to your first part, it is a huge problem that companies don't sponsor things that they depend on. If Python, for example, didn't exist when Google started in 98 or 97, then yeah, maybe they would have a way harder time to build a search engine because yeah, there were existing tools that they could use for free, even as students. They were, I guess, uh, doctoral, like they did a PhD, right, in, in Stanford. But anyway, they were still short on money and they could start easily with such tools, but they never supported Python or the community as far as I know. But maybe that's not entirely true because at least they hired the uh, inventor of Python for a while, but I wouldn't count it as sponsoring necessarily. But I guess either, either way, they could do even more with sponsoring in different projects and really go into these communities and appreciate their work. Now, Litchi is a tiny tool. Maybe it's not critical infrastructure, but certainly a thing that is critical infrastructure is the web itself. And it's so fragile. And it is the very thing that made these companies big that they just tried to destroy it right now. This is how it feels from an outsider's perspective because they take the web and they put it behind walled gardens. You need a user login and it's not indexable or you need JavaScript to read plain text. And all of these things are done to play the gatekeeper and protect your intellectual property, quote unquote, which mostly is generated by users anyway. And this makes it harder for tools like Litchi. It's kind of controversial or paradox even because they use a tool which they kind of actively try to defend by blocking requests on their own properties. And yeah, it is what it is. In any case, I would hope for more companies that understand that open source is a core part of the web and their business model. Um, apart from that, you can struggle with that and you can complain all day, but it's not going to solve the problem. We as open source maintainers need to find ways to make businesses pay. And usually businesses pay for things that they need and they cannot get elsewhere or they don't want to build. One of such things that companies like Elasticsearch were successfully doing in the past is support for enterprise features like login authentication and audit logs and proxying and 
SLAs and all of that stuff that businesses care about. Invoices is one of them and having a contact person and, you know, first level support in 24 hours and stuff like that. I might think about um, such endeavors. There might be plugins in the future, which will be open source, but they might also be proprietary or they might be under a different license for enterprises. For example, one thing that companies seem to use with Litchi is some way to check internal infrastructure. But a lot of these things are behind authentication. You have ADFS, and maybe you need to authenticate first before you can access a page. And this can be a very valuable thing if it was a plugin. This is another area where WebAssembly could come in because you could write these things in, say, Dino or TypeScript. Of course. Oh, lost Matthias again for, but he will be back. Be some sort of. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, we yeah. lost for uh, like four seconds. Companies, you could build, uh, for example, a plugin that would only do very specific business logic for one customer, and you could maintain that for them, and also maybe sell the same plugin to other companies as well. And so this would be one way to go about it. The other one that I thought about would be who really needs a link checker at scale. And the answer that I came up with was people that have a lot of documentation, people that work in businesses. For example, they build tools for developers and they want to make sure that the documentation is always up to date and correct because this is part of user experience too. And they might be willing to pay for a hosted service. Now, the idea would be you have a platform and Litchi would go and check your website and then have a dashboard and show you the broken links. But if such a thing really was extremely valuable to them, chances are they would have built something like that before and by, their sel by themselves. So it's still just a pet theory that I have that potentially someone might pay for it. But the way I see it right now is mm, twofold. One, it's okay if it stays like this and if it's just a side project that I maintain on the side. And on top of that, I think WebAssembly or a plugin system in general will enable a lot of cases that I haven't thought about yet. And that can make it a platform at some point. I'm very happy that... Initially, we build it such that it is a library and a binary, and you can kind of separate it. This was one goal, which is similar to how curl looks like internally. Curl is split into libcurl, the library, and curl, the binary. And this way, you can integrate libcurl into literally anything. And if you need support, who else should you get it from? except from the maintainers, from the authors of the tool itself. And this is this is a really, really good business model, I would say. Yeah, hopefully you will like sign some contracts with the, uh, not even sign, like uh, the author of Curl always shares funny emails that receives. So for, for that they ask for support for free. So I look forward to read your emails for uh, Litchi as well. Um, yeah, so yeah, like it's interesting, as you said, that like companies, uh, I don't know if you said it. Yeah, you said it in this question. Yeah, that companies like protect themselves from uh, these kind of tools, but then they use it to verify their docs. Yeah, it's, it's kind of controversial. Um, yeah. And also related to like this point, uh, there is another video that uh, I want to recommend to the listeners, which is called So You Want to Earn Money with Open Source. Um, and so in this video, you share that you, you can find this video on YouTube. And in this video, you share that you build uh, you built analysis uh, dash tools dot dev. And uh, the, like it, it's a website that, as we said, it shows many uh, many uh, static analysis analyzer tools. And you said that the way it's sustainable sustainable right now is that 
no you shared yeah uh, in, in this video you shared that uh, the way is sustainable right now is that you have some ads right you have some companies that pay uh, to be shown as sponsors in the readme and in the website so my question is do you think that this uh, business model that uh, can work for uh, tools like Leechy or others or other projects that are on GitHub and they're free and they they they, they have a lot of visibility and traffic, for example, in the, in the GitHub readme or in the docs? Yes. If you have a tool that has a couple hundred stars, maybe you see some traction, you can check out the access patterns. You can see when people access this repository and you can see the days in the week where people reach out and, and find your project. And if it's something that they find during work hours, this is usually a tool that they use for work. And for example, you check and Monday is your strongest day in terms of requests. That That is a good sign, I guess. And maybe Friday when they devil with new ideas. And the same for referrers, which you can also see. Sometimes you see that um, there are requests coming in from university pages, and this is usually an indicator that it's used in some course or recommended to students. But then there are also things that people Google and, and whatever. Now, if you find such a tool, also check who stars your project and maybe see where they work or what they have in common. I don't say you should necessarily reach out to everyone that stars your project. Maybe that's a bit invasive, but after a while, you see maybe a pattern. You see a company that uses it or someone that sends you a pull request, works at a certain organization. And this is a good point to start a conversation and say, hey, how do you use the project? Is it helping you? Does it solve a problem? And then you can go deeper and see, oh, yeah, do you want to support the long-term development of that tool? And you really need to sell it. It's part of your job to come up with good arguments for why this should support you. No one just gives you cash for free and without getting anything in return. What you can say is, yeah, they get exposure, but they also get seen as a company that supports open source, which is a really, really positive signal to developers. A lot of developers I know search for their tools on GitHub first, and they don't really go to Google and search. They go straight to the source. And this is how you integrate tools and services into your organization at some point. You kind of want to get the name out, and it's really valuable for them. And the moment you have one or two companies that might be interested, yeah, test the waters. Just offer them to support you, maybe on a small uh, sponsorship basis. Start with some small amount and open an open collective and ask them if you... Um, if they were able to support you in such a way. Uh, this works really well for platforms. Analysis tools is different than Litchi because analysis tools is a platform. People go there to find information and the signal to noise ratio of people that find the repository is way higher than on Google. Uh, on Google, everyone search, searches for static analysis tools or linter and there are a lot of people that not necessarily know what they don't necessarily know what they are looking for, or maybe they're just playing around a bit. And it's a very competitive market there too. But if you go to GitHub and you search for this, then chances are you are a developer looking for a solution to your problem. And then this is where they find logos of related companies. And yeah, it is an ad. It's true, but I wouldn't say it's worth the amount that they pay just to get their banner on the page. They get more than that. They get exposure and they get this reputation and peer review. So they get trust from more senior developers and this is extremely valuable to them. For Litchi, I actually had a sponsor that didn't really care about the tool at all, but they used it for their own documentation and they kind of liked it and i think this is a good way and just like a, a very small amount and 
they started to dabble into that. And I think this is good for them and for the project as well. Of course, it doesn't pay the bills, but for Litchi, I guess a better way would be to build a service around it if you want to, or build something that you can sell on a subscription basis. For example, this ebook link checker could be a nice subscription service where you can check one ebook for free per month or something, and then you take it from there. So the business model would be slightly different. Um, analysis tools is more of a B2B product, and Litchi is a B2C product. Yeah, thank you for your answer. It's it's interesting what you said that when you when a company sponsor uh, a developer and the developer puts their banner into the readme the company is not like doesn't only gain visibility for the ad but like developers that see their logo on a readme uh, they maybe they they trust the company more or they think that they care about open source and stuff like that so they also get like they gain both visibility and reputation uh, i think it's uh, it's a good uh, uh, and by the way, just real quick, you need to make it extremely clear that this is the goal when you talk to the, these companies, because we had cases where companies didn't get it. They thought it was just ad money, and they were extremely frustrated by the amount of traffic they got, and they didn't see the quality of traffic. They did just see the quantity. And these are usually not sponsors you want to have. I... I hate to say it, but there are also sponsors that you don't want to have because they are too demanding and they have the wrong expectations. So I recommend before taking on bigger sponsorships to have a screening call with the company and see if your missions align. You need to find a company that is culturally close to open source to begin with, even though they might not need to do a lot of open source, they still need to be aligned with the vision or the culture within open source very important makes sense yeah well thank you matthias it was a really insightful conversation uh, so where can people find you online guess if you're interested in me as a person then you can go to endler.dev and if you're interested in corrode the business can go to corrode.dev. Great. Yeah, I will also add, uh, yeah, consider sponsoring Matthias again on GitHub if you enjoy uh, Litchi. And yeah, that's it for this episode. Thanks everyone who arrived uh, here. Like if you arrived here, you probably liked th uh, this episode. So if you want to see more uh, of this, subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, you can search for like, and to the Rust Ship podcast in your favorite podcast, podcast client. Uh, that's it. Uh, bye, everyone. And thanks again, Matthias. You're welcome. Thanks a lot, Marco. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.